Hello, everyone. My name is Margaret Drew, and it's my honor this year to chair the ABA HIV Impact Project. Um, and we are part of the section, ABA section on civil rights and social justice. Uh, today's webinar is going to feature um, some people who have been recognized as leaders in the field of serving those living with HIV or AIDS. Um, e each time the, uh, we had to postpone our meeting this year, our conference because of COVID, but um, each time we hold a conference, we honor uh, recipients of our Forger Award, uh, which recognizes outstanding work in the field. Um, today, I'm happy to say we have with us uh, the honorees um, for the Forger Award, and our next uh, conference will be held in New Orleans in October of 2021, where the recipients will formally receive their awards. Um, we welcome you to that conference. We hope you can come. We, like many others, had to, had to cancel our scheduled uh, conference earlier this year. What we are planning uh, in this webinar series is to address issues that many of you will encounter or have encountered already in representing those living with HIV or AIDS through this pandemic. Uh, we recognize that as people who are already maybe marginalized in several ways, um, their lives have become more complex uh, and, and much more difficult, uh, including access to legal resources given uh, re remote uh, access or lack of remote access. So um, today we're going to have each of our panelists discuss what they have observed um, in the struggles for those living with HIV since the um, pandemic began. So our panelists today are Yolanda French Lawless, and these are our awardees also, Jesse Milan, uh, Scott Schultz, Schatz, excuse me, um, Armin Merzian, and William McCall. So I'm going to introduce each of our awardees as they speak. So it, now it's my honor to introduce Yolanda French Lawless. Uh, Yolanda is the managing attorney of the AIDS Law Project of Pennsylvania, um, which is a nonprofit profit public interest law firm representing those living with HIV AIDS. Uh, she's worked there since 1993, and she has obtained thousands of dollars for those living with HIV who were denied benefits from uh, the Social Security Administration. Uh, she continues that work, but also she uh, started a project in 1998 to represent uh, immigrants who were living with HIV or AIDS. And in that capacity, she has obtained asylum and other forms of relief for immigrants. And she has continued that project to today. In, in addition to that work, she also has represented uh, those living with HIV in employment issues, private disability claims, and estate planning. So Yolanda, we are happy to welcome you and we look forward to your, what you can tell us about your experience to date. Thank you, Margaret. I'm honored to be here as a panelist in part one of this webinar series. And I'm deeply grateful to be named as a 2020 recipient of the Forger Award. Uh, my perspective of serving clients during the COVID crisis is informed by the work of the AIDS Law Project as a direct legal service provider to people living with HIV in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and in Southern New Jersey. We're a small staff of 13 comprised of lawyers, paralegals and administrators. And I'm thankful that many of my ALPP family is here today along with our summer associates. So for our firm, uh, the immediate concern for serving clients during the COVID crisis was how to work remotely 
and still maintain contact with people who are living with HIV. Uh, Margaret uh, referenced accessing the legal services for people who are marginalized during the COVID crisis. And so we were concerned about being able to maintain the contact and also maintaining contact with our colleagues at AIDS service organizations who also serve people who are living with HIV. The hub of our legal services is our intake system. Uh, in pre-COVID times, a person requesting legal services would call the main office number or show up in person at the office to have an intake uh, interview conducted by uh, the intake staff. Once a week, the lawyers and paralegals would then meet, review all the new cases, and designate the person to follow up. So we started working remotely on March 13th with about one week or less to prepare to leave the office. And so, you know, we have to consider what is in our toolbox that's going to allow us to work remotely and maintain contact with the people we serve. And honestly, we didn't have a lot because the time constraints were really great. Uh, there was no time to figure out how to forward the main office number to people's homes. Uh, we don't have agency designated cell phones for staff. So um, we had to be creative. And fortunately, our deputy managing attorney um, settled on Google Suite as the option for how to do that. This isn't an advertisement for Google or anything. It's just a story about how a very small office, small nonprofit was able to make this work and not lose a day of contact with the people that we serve. So we were able to establish a Google Voice main office number for intake calls, and that was accessible remotely to the entire uh, legal team. Uh, the Google Voice number also provided text cap about capability for clients who are able to text, and we were also able to text them. Uh, individual uh, staff members installed Google Voice on their phone, so everybody actually also had an individual phone number. Uh, we have... Um, our office domain has AIDS Law PA. So the office staff uh, emails are, for example, lawless at AIDS Law PA. And so we've never really used uh, email as a way to communicate with clients unless we specifically ask and they specifically agree because of confidentiality reasons. But we felt like we still needed yet another way to reach people. So through Google Suite, we established a whole new set of email addresses and it was really uh, really cost effective and so we were able to use law projects so that was another way to communicate with our clients. Uh, in addition uh, we established a, a web-based intake form so we just set about trying to uh, utilize any way that we could to maintain the contact with the clients. Uh, in addition um, our responsibility um, for maintaining contact with people living with HIV. We also have a responsibility to main con maintain contact with people who are also serving people living with HIV. So the AIDS service organization case managers, the social workers who are in the infectious disease practices, um, we work together collaboratively with our clients. And it was important for us uh, that they were able to reach us and also that they were up to date on this information that was continuously evolving about public benefits, uh, about access to state and federal office buildings, um, about utilities, about housing. There, you know, there were just so, many, so much information coming out. So one of the things we did was establish a coronavirus bulletin board on our website. And we kept that updated in terms of um, you know, whether housing court was open, whether the Social Security Administration was functioning, all the things that were happening. Uh, we kept that updated so that people knew. And then in addition, um, we also uh, had a webinar for case managers and social workers so that they had the latest up-to-date information about public benefits, uh, accessibility for their clients. And so that was important because that's an important, you know, function of what we do. Uh, in, in service to people who live with HIV. So we have been able to keep the intake system and the client contact going consistently since we were in the office on March 12th and we left, we didn't come back after March 13th. So we haven't missed a day of intake and um, 
I think that was the thing that uh, I've, I've been most nervous about. Uh, and, you know, the thing that uh, somebody asked what keeps you up during, during COVID about clients. And that was one of the things that kept me up that somebody would fall, uh, you know, through the gaps. And fortunately that has not happened. Uh, so we've been able to reach people, they've been able to reach us, and we've been able to continue to provide services. So that was the intake system. So people did call, and we actually received a lot of very COVID-specific concerns from people living with HIV. And our earliest uh, calls that was COVID-specific started the week of March 17th. Those calls basically centered around people who were living with HIV or who may have had other uh, underlying medical conditions who were concerned about going to work. Uh, the very first call uh, was a, a, a guy, a person living with HIV, and he was a one-to-one -one behavioral health counselor. And he had seen a client who, uh, unbeknownst to him, had exhibited symptoms of COVID. Uh, they had supplied the client with uh, gloves and a mask and the client had taken them off. And so when he found out about it, he wanted to basically leave work. He just didn't want to work anymore. He was afraid. Um, and so he called us to ask, you know, if he had any legal protections for, you know, his income and or his job security. Um, he later learned that he had actually been socially exposed uh, to somebody who actually did test positive for HIV. So, uh, it was important for him to be able to, to leave the job. Uh, similarly, we received a call from somebody who wasn't in healthcare. She was an office worker and her doctor had actually advised her to isolate herself, self-isolate because of her health. Uh, she took the step at that time to apply for short-term disability through the uh, employer-provided disability program. And of course she was denied. She wasn't sick which is what applying for disability and getting disability requires that you be sick. And so uh, private disability carriers are not gonna acknowledge the underlying health condition that makes you need to isolate um, because of uh, COVID-19. Um, and then in April, we heard from another client whose doctor had provided a letter to the employer saying that the client needed to be removed from any job related activity where he would be in close contact with crowds. Now, fortunately, our client's job didn't require close contact with crowds, but he used public transportation to get to work. The employer just refused to acknowledge that as a risk to him, even though he had uh, the doctor's letter saying that he, he didn't need to be in close contact with crowds. And the employer thought, well, it's not here at work, so it doesn't matter. The good news is that the CARES Act was signed on March 27, 2020. And for the first client who called the week of March 17th, we were trying to work out his issues and always developing some creative strategy to protect him. He also didn't want the employer to know his HIV status. So we were trying to work through that. Um, he also tested positive. So that sort of resolved his issue. He was out of there. Um, but when the CARES Act was signed, we were able to advise our clients of their options under Title II of assistance for American workers, families, and businesses. And that relief was that they were able to receive unemployment compensation based on either having to quit their job or the direct result of their inability to work because the healthcare provider advised them not to work. So um, we were able to give them the advice and that advice included information about traditional unemployment compensation and the best news of all for many of our clients who many are not traditional workers. They may be gig workers. Uh, they may be uh, people who work off the books under the table. They uh, may be part-time workers. And so they're not traditional workers, not eligible for traditional unemployment compensation. And the CARES Act included pandemic unemployment assistance for those workers who are not traditionally eligible. So we were able to evaluate and assess whether those callers were eligible and give them the advice to start that process. And that's still continuing. And I think those calls are picking up now because in Pennsylvania, we uh, moved through these phases of red, yellow, and green. And so just about, I think every um, county is in green by this point. 
And so people are now coming back to work. Employers are expecting people to return to work if they were shut down. And, um, and so they're now saying to their employees, well, if you don't come back to work, you're not eligible for unemployment because it's a voluntary termination. You quit your job. And it's been our responsibility and our pleasure actually to advise people, no, you really don't have to come back because you would still um, be eligible for UC, for unemployment compensation. And we found that there are some employers who really are trying to bully their employees uh, into working by telling them that their failure to report to work is a voluntary quit. Uh, in the last week, we received a call from a person who's living with HIV and she also has asthma, which her doctor says puts her at even greater risk than HIV for uh, COVID-19. She's working as a CNA at a nursing home. And she took FMLA because her doctor told her she couldn't continue with the nursing home, but she anticipated when she did, when she took the FMLA, by the end of the 12 weeks, things will be better. Things are not better, things are probably worse. Uh, she did file for use unemployment and she began receiving it. So when the 12 weeks ended, the employer told her that not returning to work was a voluntary quit and that her unemployment compensation would end. And she came to us for advice and we were able to give her the proper advice is that uh, one, she's looking for work. She's just not gonna work at the CNA. She wants to work. So she's able to keep her unemployment and she's able to continue to report that she is looking for work. She just does, can't do the CNA work. Another uh, COVID uh, specific area was the economic stimulus payment, that $1,200 per individual. We got a lot, a lot of calls about the uh, stimulus payment. And there were so many mixed messages about eligibility, eligibility for it. Like every day, it seemed like the news was a little bit different. So, um, you know, for all of these things, in terms of representing clients, it was constantly having to go back to check to see what it is that they had read and what was actually the correct information and then getting the information to them. So we had uh, uh, the majority of calls were from people who didn't have a social security benefit or they hadn't filed taxes since 2018. So those are the things that put you on the treasury department's radar. Uh, so one is like, are you eligible? Yes, they were eligible, but they had to do something to get the automatic payment. So that was the process of just talking them through how to get the automatic payment or talking to their case managers about how to get the automatic payment. So. Um, there were a lot of calls about that. Uh, and another matter was, uh, there was a question of whether or not people who reside in nursing homes, whether that $1,200 belonged to them or not. Of course they belonged to them. <laughs> and so that, that was something else that, um, you know, it was a little hard to resolve because uh, the client and the social worker at the nursing home were convinced that it wasn't his money, but it was his money. Um, one of the practice areas that requires us to come up with creative ways to serve our client during COVID crisis um, is estate documents. Uh, medical powers attorney and uh, living will specifically, uh, clients request those uh, services all the time, but in March, they were a lot more anxious about it. Um, we found that people were really terrified that they would end up in the hospital. Uh, they wouldn't have anybody designated to make their decisions for them. If somebody was making the decision for them because they didn't have the documents, it may be some biological family member who they, from whom they were estranged. Um, so that was really a concern. Now, Normally what happens is that people who request these documents, they come to our office and we have two staff members there to witness the execution of the documents. Um, but based on our clients' anxieties about not having any, these documents in place, we had to adopt a harm reduction model in providing the service. So instead of just saying, we can't do it, we're in the middle of this pandemic, we're not seeing people it just, it wasn't possible and it, 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 for us, it just wasn't right. It, it wasn't the right thing to do. So we decided harm reduction. 
So the client would contact us, we would uh, draft the documents, we would email them or first class mail the documents back and forth with the client. Uh, once the documents were finalized or finalized, our paralegal, John, who likes to drive a lot, John uh, arranges with the client to actually visit them in their home or at their home. And so the understanding is that when possible, the appointment takes place outdoors. And whether it's indoors or outdoors, the uh, six feet distancing is maintained. Uh, John has a mask, wears gloves, uh, and has disposable pens. And he takes the same for the clients. So he takes gloves, mask, pins to the clients. And so we've been able to do that. And it just, it, it gets um, really sort of labor intensive to make this happen, but it's all worth it for the clients to relieve their anxiety. So once he gets there, he FaceTimes me. I'm one witness, John is the other witness. And we get the documents done. He mails them the originals to me. I make copies and mail all the uh, documents out to the people who are designated. So it's a lot of activity but the client is relieved at the end. And that's the important thing. And I'm not telling you this because it involves a great legal strategy because it's not a great legal strategy. I'm just relaying that the state document story is an, an example of how we have to be willing to find ways to meet the needs of people who are living with HIV during the COVID crisis. Because as Margaret referenced at the beginning that these are some of the most marginalized people who are experiencing this and uh, we want to make sure that their needs are met to the extent that we can. Uh, that brings me to my final point is that it would be much easier to meet the people, to meet the needs of people living with HIV during this crisis if they had access to the technology that many people take for granted and assume that everybody has. And I have become acutely and painfully aware that not everybody has access. The number of clients who don't have internet, who don't have computers, in an era where we're talking about Zoom for court, we're talking about telemedicine to meet your healthcare needs, with uh, no ability to file uh, appeals or applications with the government online, all of those things, people are gonna fall through the cracks because of lack of technology. So I think if there's anything that needs to change in terms of marginalization and meet the needs of people with HIV, it's the technology needs. Thanks. Thank you, Yolanda. And I'll remind uh, those uh, participating that if you have questions, you may ask them in the Q&A function of Zoom. So next, I'd like to introduce Jesse Milan, Jr., who is president and CEO of AIDS United. AIDS United is a national organization focused on policy, grant making, and capacity building and has granted over $120 million um, over 30 years. Um, its, public policy, its public policy council organizations and current grantees number over 340 different states and territories. Uh, Mr. Milan is a lawyer whose career includes leading HIV programs and organizations at national, regional, and global levels. He's chaired five nonprofit boards, including Black AIDS Institute, uh, was AIDS director for Philadelphia, and has chaired federal advisory committees. He currently serves on the scientific advisory board for the president's emergency plan for our AIDS relief. Um, he is a graduate of Princeton University and New York University School of Law, and has been living with HIV for over 30 years. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much. And thank you to the HIV Committee of the American Bar Association. It is a great honor to receive the Forger Award and to serve with these wonderful colleagues, many of whom I've known for a very long time. Um, Yolanda has given you a lot of information about direct services, legal services, and because AIDS United is a national organization focused on strategic grant making, policy, and capacity building, 
our member organizations and our grantees provide services to your clients. So our clients are your clients in a different way because they're providing prevention, treatment, care, and advocacy services. And I wanna share with you what we've done in learning what those services are and how your clients are being impacted by COVID-19 because of how the service delivery organizations are being impacted by COVID-19. And we call what we are doing Relief, Recovery, and Resilience through a system, through a series of webinars and also through a national survey that we've recently conducted. And I want to share with you those results and the activities that we are doing at Age United. Um, first, I'm going to share with you that um, as I said, we're a strategic grant making policy and, and capacity building organization. We're headquartered in Washington. And as a national organization that is a public health organization, we had to address COVID right away. So I want you to know that our office, I made the decision that we would close our entire physical office through the end of this year. Because we're public health, we didn't want to put any of our constituents or our staff in any harm's way. So we suspended all business travel for them throughout the year and all in-person meetings for the rest of the year. And we've also provided some in-home financial support for our staff so that they can meet the, the technological issues that they need to operate from home. Externally, uh, our grants are being changed. So many of the grant organizations that are in your communities receive funding from us. And we've changed a lot of those grants to general operating support so that they can have the resources they need to operate in this new COVID-19 pandemic world. And we've used some of their parameters and we're also seeking new resources from external sources like foundations so that we can give more money to the community. But these last things I wanted to share with you that we've done have been particularly helpful and are useful for today. We have a, a FAQ, Frequently Asked Questions on COVID-19 for people living with HIV. This was created by AIDS United and eight of our national partners, including the uh, Positive Women's Network and the HIV Medical Association. And that document is available on our website, and I urge you to have it available for your clients as you're meeting with them. And then AIDS Watch, our national policy and advocacy event, our national survey, and this webinar series. And I'm going to give you highlights from this webinar on our national survey for HIV AIDS programs. So first, I'm going to share with you that we made a big transition at the very top of the pandemic at the beginning of March to change what is our signature event called AIDS Watch, where we bring people living with HIV to Washington to advocate for policies and appropriations directly with Congress. That event uh, happens every year. We just celebrated its 25th anniversary a few years ago. But in the last couple of years, especially in the Trump administration and with a divided Congress, the AIDS Watch event has been larger than ever. And so last year, we had over 600 people come to go and meet directly with Congress. By changing it to an all virtual event on just a few weeks notice, we were able to have even more people participate in AIDS Watch this year. 2,500 people participated in some part of AIDS Watch this year, and they are convening, continue to do their advocacy in, their, in, in districts with their Congress members and with their senators about the appropriations and policies needed for HIV and AIDS. Now, you know that the president has initiated this new program called Ending the HIV Epidemic in America with the goal of reducing all new infections by 2025 and by 90% by 2030, and of course, increasing the number of people who are virally suppressed by 90% by 2030. But what is the impact of COVID on prevention, treatment, and care services and advocacy services as well. So that's what we've looked at. And I wanna give you some of the highlights from our national survey. Now, as you've heard, we have 55 members of our public policy council. We have another 250 organizations who are our grantees. And I'm gonna give you a flavor for who they are because they are providing the services to your clients for prevention, treatment, and care. Amita Care in, in New York, which is one of the largest organizations, GMHC, well-known in New York City, Fenway Health in Boston, Legacy in Texas, My Brother's Keeper in Jackson, Mississippi, 
Vivint Health, which is providing services across the Midwest in Texas, Missouri, and Wisconsin. These organizations see your clients every day to provide them with medications and other kinds of care. But what has been the impact of them? Well, we sent out the survey to all of our grantees and all of those public council members, and we got back 140 responses from organizations all across the country. 30% of those are in the South, which is so important because the ending the HIV epidemic initiative of the federal administration is concentrating so many new resources in the South where half of all new infections and half of all new deaths are still occurring. So responses from the South were particularly important. And the variety of sizes of organizations we heard from, some mid-sized with 20 or 25 employees, and some very, very small, especially smaller advocacy organizations in grassroots levels. We heard from all levels of that. What did we hear? Well, because of COVID, many of them actually made no immediate changes in how they provide services to your clients, but 37% modified their hours of operation, but not surprisingly, 77% made major changes by changing their staff to operating remotely or via telehealth. Now within that 77%, we learned that 29% had transitioned their entire staff to working remotely and 63% had over half of their staff working remotely. And as you heard from Yolanda, how you operate rem remotely, particularly when you're doing clinical services, required a major change in the approaches of HIV prevention, treatment, and care services. Many of those organizations, virtually all of them, including AIDS United, are not for profits. Many people didn't know that not-for-profits were also eligible for the payroll protection program to help those organizations like AIDS United and our members maintain their payrolls so that they weren't furloughing staff while we were figuring out how to operate under this new COVID world. By the, by the time we received our responses back, 60% had said they applied and 71% of that 60 had actually received a payroll protection uh, program funds, PPP funds. Those have been huge lifesavers, particularly for uh, those of us who are nonprofits. And not surprisingly, there were layoffs and there were furloughs among aid service provider organizations. This was a snapshot as of the 15th of May when we received those responses, but I know that more layoffs and more furloughs are happening all across the HIV landscape. What are the services that have been impacted by COVID? Well, before COVID-19, 11% of that 140 organizations providing prevention, treatment, and care services were providing dental care. Because of COVID, that percentage has been reduced by half. Only 5% are now providing dental care to people living with HIV. Think about the impact of that for people like me living with HIV. Other kinds of services have been reduced like re-engagement services. We need know that we need to keep people fully engaged so that they are adherent to their, to their medications. Psychological support services to make sure people are dealing with the, the stigma and the trauma of their lives. Advocacy services have also been decreased because of COVID-19. But here where we're hearing increases, an increase in the need for housing, an increase in the need for food services to people living with HIV, and a 100% increase in the requests for services that, are, that are address insurance and other kinds of benefits, especially health benefits. You can imagine that many clients living with HIV need help on how they apply for unemployment insurance and for COBRA and for other and maintaining their health insurance benefits. So on a client level, we heard from many of our organizations that the number one thing they were hearing from their clients was an increased need for housing support, an increased need for food support, an increased need for rent and utility support, 
but we're also hearing a lot about an increased need for substance abuse services. We keep hearing episodic information about how substance abuses are increasing, but we're also hearing specifically around SSP, syringe service programs, are having a great deal of difficulty staying in business because of a reduced a source of income for uh, providing those services. So, and we know that substance abuse and particularly needle exchange services are so critical to help us turn the tide of this epidemic domestically and globally as well. We have heard fortunately that many nonprofit organizations at grassroots level are getting support from their funders by having more flexibility about the funds they're receiving. This has been true with Age United and how we're approaching our grantees by changing so many strictly programmatic grants to more general operating grants to give organizations more flexibility on how they can stay open in these, in these uncertain times. And we're continuing to hear that not-for-profits, these grassroots organizations across the country are very concerned about the economic impact of COVID-19 and how they're going to maintain their operations, not only throughout 2020, but how they're going to maintain their operations into 2021 and 2022, where the funding base and, and federal funds might be, might be very well drying up. So I hope this is helpful in giving you an overview of how your clients are being impacted as they are clients of other services, particularly for prevention, treatment, care, and support services. So with that, thank you so much, Margaret, and I'm available later for questions. Thank you, Jesse. That was quite helpful. Um, our next uh, awardee and speaker is Armin Mergian who is one of the nation's leading uh, HIV, AIDS, and civil rights attorneys. Uh, for over two decades at housing work in the HIV Law Project, Armin has conducted impact litigation on issues involving HIV and AIDS, homelessness, public benefits, disability, gender, and housing discrimination. He has litigated numerous landmark cases and is co-author of the National Treatise on AIDS, AIDS and the Law. Armin is a member of the AB AIDS HIV Impact Project, and he is the author of 17 law review articles on human and civil rights. His latest article will be found in the Columbia Human Rights Law Review um, at the end of this year. So thank you, Ar Armin. Joining us. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you everyone for joining us, and of course to the ABA for this honor. Um, I'd like to speak first about some echoes from the past. For those of us who have lived and worked through both of these pandemics, there are some uh, differences and some uh, similarities, some eerie similarities, and I thought I'd just lead off with that. Um, the weak uh, government, federal government response to both pandemics is eerily familiar to those of us who've been around from the beginning. For viewers who are too young to remember who, or who weren't in the field, uh, when uh, the AIDS crisis hit the United States, President Reagan refused even to utter the words HIV or AIDS year after year. So talk about a federal government not responding to a crisis. We had a federal government that literally stuck, uh, put its head in the sand and refused to even utter the word, and I mean year after year, as thousands died. Uh, the press secretary for the president, in fact, laughed uh, when pressed on the issue of HIV and AIDS, laughed at the, uh, the pandemic that we were going through. The Supreme Court took years to take uh, cert and uh, rule on a single case while discrimination was rampant. And it is so familiar to the utter lack of federal guidance and response uh, to the essential disbanding of the task force on COVID-19 now. And if reports are to be, be believed, the president's new approach, which is that we just have to live with this. I mean, it is very familiar to those of us uh, who've lived through both pandemics and worked through them. And it is a sorry uh, state of affairs. The stigma and prejudice that we're seeing as a result of COVID-19 is also similar. Early in the days of HIV and AIDS, uh, and sadly to some extent still, uh, gay men and others were targeted. Uh, Haitian Americans were wrongfully, everyone wrongfully, of course, but particularly wrongfully tarred with the brush of infamy over uh, HIV and the spread of HIV uh, with no basis. And today we see Asian Americans uh, because of coronavirus being the subject of hate crimes and other 
uh, prejudice. Um, and I say Asian Americans, not just Chinese Americans, because of course bigots never make that distinction. It is one of the hallmarks of bigots and bigotry to be that ignorant, but that's what we're looking at. Um, we also see once again, right, that COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting marginalized populations, just as the HIV AIDS uh, uh, pandemic and epidemic has, has uh, shown us. It is once again revealing, laying bare the intersections of race, poverty, and healthcare, and the, and the profound injustice that we see in this country. Um, part of the Black Lives Movement uh, uh, Matter movement has to take into account these incredible health disparities, uh, housing, health, so many other things that are tied together and, and hitting our folks um, hard. Black and Latinx folks here in New York are dying at a rate that is two times the rate of white people in New York. Uh, homeless people, homeless folks in New York, disproportionately black and brown, are dying at a rate that is 61% higher than the general population. And I believe that's undercounted because homeless statistics are always notoriously undercounted. So we are seeing profound differences in the way marginalized folks are being hit by this. Uh, there are some differences though. Uh, New York, for example, the health department put out a guide on how to have safe sex during the coronavirus. For those of us long timers dealing with HIV and AIDS, the notion year after year that the government or any government would put out some sort of guide on, on safe sex uh, with regard to HIV and AIDS is it, it just anathema, insane to any of us. So there are some other positive changes there. Um, of course, many rightfully suspect that the fact that local governments are now uh, stepping up and doing something different and more timely and more vigorously is as a result of the fact that coronavirus strikes everyone and not just marginalized populations. That is a sad truth that I think um, uh, we are wrestling with. But whatever the case, uh, there is a more robust government response, at least at the local and state level in many states and localities. And I think that our community has to take some credit for that. Uh, HIV advocates, uh, whether in uh, litigation, whether lawyers, community-based and other folks have demanded changes and those changes are redounding to the benefit of everyone, including our populations now. Uh, in 1997 in New York, for example, we were able to pass a law that guaranteed medically appropriate housing for folks who are homeless and living with HIV. And that included an individual room so that uh, quarantining, self-quarantining, isolation is possible in, a, in, in one's own room as opposed to congregate or shared housing. And so well preceding this virus, we already had in place uh, that protection. And then through litigation, we sued the Giuliani administration to make sure our folks got that on the same day because they were sending people out into snowbanks overnight uh, without housing. them. And we were able, able to sue the Giuliani administration to make sure that that housing was minimally habitable, that it was accessible and safe. And so uh, it is a success story that our community has brought about. And New York has taken a page from our community and set up uh, COVID hotel shelters for the general homeless population, not just those living with HIV and AIDS. And that's an echo of the past with our community. It is a, a, a way in which we have forged a trail. Because of course in New York, like so many municipalities, these hotels are not being used. We, it's, it's an absolute injustice that homeless people are suffering from COVID and dying in the shadow of these lovely hotels that are completely not being used. But New York has done something about it. And Housing Works, I'm proud to say, is running a, a shelter for folks who are homeless and living with COVID and not merely to provide a place to stay, but wrap around services, psychosocial case management, food services, medical services, and other things all tied in, uh, which is what our folks need. So there are some important differences and there are some strides forward. I don't wanna be all gloom and doom. Uh, with regard to the struggles that people living with HIV and AIDS are facing in particular here, um, uh, my colleagues have talked about some of those uh, struggles, so I won't, uh, um, dwell on them. Technology is a, is a tremendous problem. Our folks rightfully fear or cannot attend in-person uh, conferences, uh, so uh, we rely on technology, but we are talking about indigent, homeless, and formerly homeless folks, low-income folks, and uh, as Ms. Lawless pointed out, a huge percentage of them do not have either the technology or the know-how and the experience using that technology to make it work. So it's a profound challenge. And we find ourselves relying on snail mail back to the old days to get things signed and done. But when you're talking about subsistence benefits and people's core rights, snail mail is not the best way because folks are waiting and are being delayed in getting subsistence benefits, the food stamps, the housing assistance and other things on which they rely to live. So 
those are all huge issues that have been touched on. I will in my, in my remaining time then talk about some practice areas and some of the things that we're seeing specific to those areas for our folks living with HIV and AIDS. Um, with the closings and immigration, I'll start with immigration. With so many closings, we have folks whose court dates have been canceled or postponed often without even another date. And the immigration process has always been incredibly difficult, nerve wracking for clients, right? I mean, to come to another country, often uh, fleeing persecution and to try to secure status and to try to secure rulings is already incredibly difficult. And remember that stress is a killer for our community. Stress is very bad for the immune system. Well, profound amounts of stress are now being heaped on because of the closure of uh, immigration offices and courts and uh, uh, the canceling or postponing of court dates often without a date. Now, to give you an example, Folks uh, who are immigrants living with HIV and AIDS may be waiting for pre call status, persons residing under color of law. That status allows you then to gain benefits depending on the municipality, and that can be housing assistance and food stamps and public assistance. And until your pre call, until you have your receipts from the government showing that you're known to the government and residing under the color of law, you can't get those benefits. And so those delays are huge. Folks are waiting for work authorization, for example, to come in. They need those cards to be able to get a job. Um, and lawfully support themselves and their families and loved ones and work authorization obviously is taking longer. But perhaps the most poignant and difficult thing that our folks are facing is with regard to, for example, asylum. We're talking about folks who are coming here who are fleeing persecution based on HIV and AIDS and often the intersection of that and uh, sexual orientation or gender because they often go hand in hand sadly throughout the world. And so we're talking about folks sharing trauma when we develop their stories in order to set forth their case and their plea for asylum, we are setting forth some of the most horrid things you can deal with. We're talking about rape, we're talking about assault, we're talking about beatings, uh, we're talking about imprisonment. Those things are extremely difficult even in person. One of the hallmarks of trauma is an inability to remember or desire not to remember those horrible things and to compartmentalize them. You build rapport and you build empathy in person with clients something that's extremely difficult or impossible when you're doing it even on a Zoom call, much less by phone, which is how the majority of our folks are proceeding. So it is an extreme challenge to us in the field, uh, particularly of asylum, to develop these poignant facts with folks who wouldn't want to share them even after meeting in person. And remember for new cases, you're dealing with an attorney, a person you've never dealt with before. And folks coming from countries where they don't, which don't have the same systems as ours, aren't completely comfortable talking to anyone about these things. They're not quite sure, where are you? Are you a government attorney? If you work with the government and you file papers with the government, are you therefore part of the government? And should I be sharing these, these secrets and these horrors with you? So it's a, it's a real concern. Uh, it's also been very difficult to get corroborating evidence and that ties into the benefits work as well. So when you're trying to get SSI or SSD, you wanna get supportive medical documentation and other documentation. Well that's become incredibly difficult because so many doctor's offices are closed or working remotely or working more slowly. How do we get the corroborating evidence that we need for immigration cases? And that can be abroad as well. We might need police reports or how do we get it here domestically in order to support our cases? It's become a, a serious challenge. Um, budgeting finally with regard to benefits is a huge challenge. Our folks were often the first to be laid off in this crisis. They were service workers, they were security guards, they worked at rental car companies, they were the first to go. Their budgets were based on an assumption that they would be bringing in a salary over a, a, a period of time, but they're not bringing in that salary anymore. And so there's a need immediately to be budget. And remember that the smallest things can trip folks up, even those who continue to get SSI, SSD, veterans checks, they may need an air conditioner they may have increased food costs because they no longer are getting free food at the programs that they attend. There's so many things that can derail the life of a poor low income person, which then can lead to rental arrears and my next subject, because of course that is a great fear for all of us. I will say finally with benefits, there's one other concern and that is virtual or telephonic hearings. Those have been unfurled now, perhaps understandably in some ways because of the pandemic, but the fear is that those will continue to be used. And we have grave concerns over the due process rights and implications of telephonic or other hearings for our folks who are not able, as Ms. Lawless pointed out, to even utilize the technology and whether that technology is even a fair and uh, way of proceeding on such poignant matters. 
Finally, uh, I'll just talk briefly about housing. There was a separate seminar on this and we are now hearing finally a lot about this basic human right because it is in peril in the United States. Before even getting to uh, evictions, I'll note that we have great fears about repairs. Landlords are using the, the cover of the pandemic to do nothing for folks. And for folks living with HIV and AIDS, some of these housing circumstances are a matter of life and death and threaten the faith, safety of folks, as they do for anyone, but often particularly are folks who are living not only with HIV and AIDS, but with comorbidities that make it difficult to live in these circumstances. Uh, but folks who uh, even, uh, again, who are wrestling to pay their share of the rent uh, we, we fear we'll face a tsunami of, of, of non-pays, of evictions that are coming down the line. And uh, so there is a tremendous need for a bailout with regard to, to living space. Uh, we say in the HIV AIDS community that housing is healthcare. It is a means of staying alive and you cannot, without a stable home, follow your medication regimen and fight this illness. And it is a huge fear that we have in our community that many are gonna be thrown out onto the street. If we can bail out the auto industries, if I, as I've said in other forums, the insurance companies, the automakers, then we can bail out poor and low income folks whose very life and livelihood depends upon having a stable home. And I hope finally that that can be done in a way that's negotiated so that landlords who have enjoyed inflated rents uh, uh, due to gentrification and other uh, measures and, and, and phenomena that we've seen do not simply get a windfall, but that it's negotiated, but in such a way as to preserve homes. So those are just some of the practice areas that we're seeing major challenges in uh, for our community. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Armin. And we look forward to hearing from you uh, in another webinar devoted to uh, housing issues. Uh, next, our next awardee is Scott Schotz of Lambda Legal. Uh, Scott lives openly with HIV and is counsel and HIV project director at Lambda Legal. Scott litigates high impact cases involving discriminatory actions based on a person's HIV status and authors amicus briefs, uh, friend of the court briefs on issues uh, of import to people living with HIV. His policy portfolio includes HIV criminalization and the blood donation band. And he served on the Presidential Advisory Council on HIV AIDS from 2014 to 2017. Thank you for joining us, Scott. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margaret. Thank you for, for having me. And, um, uh, and like the other awardees, thank you so much for, uh, for honoring me with the, with the Forger Award. It is, um, it is a lovely uh, thing to be uh, recognized in that way. Thank you. Um, so I want to talk a little bit today about uh, some of the, the messaging that went out around uh, COVID uh, at the very beginning and, um, and uh, some of the potential harms that, um, that, could, that did or could have uh, and still could um, arise out of a less than subtle uh, messaging and you know Armin referred to uh, seeing the uh, the publication from the New York uh, City Department of Public Health around safe sex and how great it was to see um, safe sex in the age of COVID talked about uh, in such a sex positive way. Um, that's what I think really made it different than what we saw in earlier times uh, around HIV. And I'm very sensitive to the ways in which uh, public health messaging in the past has sometimes um, created the very fear and stigma that we, uh, that we then see people living with HIV experience. And so when, um, when the news first started breaking on COVID and, uh, and we saw, you know, there were public health messages going out about uh, who was at highest risk and who was most vulnerable. And, um, and those messages talked about people uh, who were immunocompromised. Um, and uh, so, of course, I think uh, most people living with HIV uh, thought that that uh, in, it automatically included them um, when, uh, when that is not the, the actual case. And uh, I mean, the fact was, if, like with anything new, there wasn't much proof of, of anything at the beginning. Um, and no one knew, and I think to a large degree, um, there's still a lot of unknowns in terms of 
how the, the virus operates and, and who is most vulnerable and whether they are more vulnerable to catch it or whether they are more vulnerable to have uh, adverse, uh, more serious consequences of COVID. Um, there's still a lot of unknowns there. Um, but this message went out that uh, I know I started receiving calls from people living with HIV uh, uh, and, and really personal calls um, uh, from family members who uh, wanted to know or assumed that, um, that I was at higher risk uh, because I was living with HIV. I mean, it's right there in the, in the name, right? It's the uh, human immunodeficiency virus. So then when you, know, you hear that someone who's immunocompromised and I think what a lot of folks even living with HIV don't realize um, is that if you are in treatment, if you are uh, you know, in a place where your viral load is suppressed and your, your uh, CD4 count has returned to what's considered a normal level, that, uh, that you really don't have an immuno, a compromised immune system anymore. Your immune system is functioning um, like anybody else's. And so this was a piece of information that I had learned in some litigation that we were doing um, that I really wasn't even aware of until not that long ago, that there really is no, uh, no difference in terms of how your immune system is going to uh, handle now, uh, handle a, a, a virus or an infection. Of course, once again, I'll just caveat this with, this is a new virus. So Obviously, you know, this is based on information about what we know about all previous viruses, but, um, but that's based on what we know about all those previous viruses. It seems like uh, someone with HIV who had well-controlled HIV would not be at higher risk. And, um, and so, so this messaging that was going out was, I think, a little bit uh, alarmist in some ways, uh, which in some cases, I think uh, you want to be. Um, right. The idea is to put people on notice and to make sure that you are getting the word out to people that uh, that they need to be careful that this is a real risk for them. And yet, at the same time, um, there didn't there wasn't a need to create extra anxiety for uh, people who were not at higher risk. Um, so I think it's it's a very subtle and tricky thing to try to to navigate. But I think it was also important that we do it um, or we try to do it. So I did a lot of work at the beginning trying to tailor those messages to make sure that they were both ac that they were accurate and that we were telling people both what we knew and what we didn't know. Um, so that in an, at a time when there was a lot of anxiety uh, for everyone, that we weren't creating a ton of extra anxiety for people who uh, who didn't need to have extra anxiety at that point. The other thing that, uh, so then coming out of that, uh, in addition to reducing anxiety for people who, uh, who didn't need to be living with extra anxiety in that moment, um, there was also this effect on the work that I had been doing and that I'm continuing to do um, in some of our cases. Uh, I mentioned that I, I really gained this information about the compromised immune system from experts that we were working with in one of our cases. Uh, and that's the case that we have against the military uh, challenging their uh, restrictions on the service of people living with HIV. And one of the things that the military has been relying upon in defending this case is their notion that uh, people living with HIV, even those who have well-controlled HIV, um, have a compromised immune system and that they can't go out into a deployment situation um, because they have a compromised immune system. So it was important to me in this other arena that uh, public health not be putting out a message that seemed to support um, their defense of this case. Um, mostly because, you know, I, it's inaccurate, <laughs> um, but, you know, to have public health come out and sort of blur those lines was not going to be helpful in terms of advancing the rights of people living with HIV to work in these types of situations, to work in places where they might be exposed to, um, to viruses or um, they might have uh, more difficulty uh, navigating um, that employment situation, like a deployment in the military, uh, if they were indeed immunocompromised. Um, so, so that was the second piece. But then finally, the, the third piece, and this came up a little bit later, but I think is in some ways the most important, um, is what is 
what started to happen around the possibility of rationing of care. And um, as for folks who aren't aware of this issue, there was a real concern in New York. And now I think um, while we thought we got through it, um, we're now seeing this start to arise again in other hot spots um, where COVID is, is rampant, um, is this idea that there will not be enough um, beds, there will not be enough uh, ventilators for, uh, to put people on. And uh, then there started to arise a question of, of who gets the ventilators. Um, if we get to a place where we're running out of ventilators and you have more than one person who needs that ventilator that is now available, um, how do healthcare providers decide who is going to receive that ventilator? And um, so this is another place where the misperception that a person living with HIV has uh, less of a chance of success in uh, overcoming the uh, COVID um, and surviving or having a good outcome um, based on their HIV status, that that could result in them being deprioritized on the list of those who uh, would get that ventilator. So uh, we became very alarmed about this. And you know, we, we thought at first, you know, this would be happening all across the country because of what we saw was happening in New York. Um, and then uh, to, to respond to this, we really worked with the disability rights advocates community who have a similar concern um, among for people with disabilities, um, that there's a perception of a, a lesser quality of life or sometimes that their condition um, is, uh, would make them more susceptible to a severe, more severe outcome. Um, and so they were working hard to ensure that disabilities would not uh, impact that decision. Um, we kind of jumped onto their bandwagon and then uh, I got to work with the AIDS Institute. Uh, we put together a couple of documents. One was to assist advocates in various states um, because really these are statewide guidelines that are put out um, to helping to uh, inform healthcare providers and their decisions around rationing of care. And so we have a document that is to assist in a template for advocating with a state government uh, to ensure that there's uh, non-discriminatory guidelines put in place that protect the rights of people with disabilities, uh, including HIV. Um, and then we also put together a know your rights for people who are living with HIV so that they are aware of this issue. Uh, if particularly if they're living in a place where rationing of care is starting to happen, uh, it's important that uh, before they might end up in a situation uh, where a decision like that was being made, possibly without even their real knowledge, that they go into that um, situation, possibly being hospitalized with COVID, um, recognizing what their rights are and how they might uh, in ensure that their rights are enforced and that there's somebody who's going to stand up for their rights um, and stand up for them in, in those situations. So both those documents are available on the Lambda Legal website. And, um, and I can share those resources if there's a way for us to put that out to, to folks who are, um, who are listening to this right now. Um, I do think, again, because uh, we now are seeing places where, H, uh, where COVID is on the rise, um, Arizona, Texas, Florida, uh, et cetera, California again, um, that it will be important for folks to have, uh, one, to get these guidelines uh, in place in their state. Uh, so for advocates potentially to, to make sure that their state has good guidelines. And then for people living with HIV in those places where uh, rationing may take place in the future to learn about this issue and recognize and know their rights. Uh, because it, it really is a matter of, could be a matter of life and death for them. So. With that, I'll, uh, I'll close and hand it back to Margaret. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scott. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Bill McCall. And he's also one of our awardees. And Bill is a strategic consultant and advocate on behalf of criminal justice reform, fair and equitable healthcare policies and ending HIV AIDS and harm reduction and drug policy reform. With 25 years of experience in congressional appropriations and advocacy, he is currently working with Congress on the COVID response, criminal justice sentencing alternatives, and overdose prevention. 
He has long worked to enact and implement health care reform, effectively advocated for ending the ban on federal funding for syringe exchange twice, uh, multiple successful reauthorizations of SAMHSA and the Ryan White Care Act, uh, treatment instead of incarceration in almost all facets of HIV national policy, ending HIV specific criminal prosecutions throughout the US and other state level advocacy. Mr. McCall previously worked as vice president. Thank you, Margaret. I'm, I, I, I know that that kind of goes on there. So, uh, so I'd love to I, go on ahead. I limited it to one more sentence. Okay. <laughs> that you uh, worked as vice president of AIDS United. Well, I guess that's important. <laughs> that is important. And director of the National Affairs and Drug Policy Alliance. So thank you, Bill. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. Um, I was also, uh, actually, I was overwhelmed to have been selected for an Alexander Forger Award and I'm grateful uh, for this incredible honor. I'd like to thank um, my colleagues and the staff at the uh, ABA HIV AIDS Impact Project. Um, it's been incredibly rewarding to work with the project for many years, and um, I, I do thank you. Thanks also to um, everyone on the panel, Margaret, Yolanda, Jesse, who was in fact my boss at Age United and uh, we've been colleagues for many years and uh, Armin and Scott, um, I really appreciate uh, all of these comments. So in some ways, uh, my work has changed incredibly uh, in just the last few months um, in part because of COVID COVID, because, but I also made a, a rather interesting career change in January, having decided to uh, uh, leave my home of the last 16 years at Age United and, and going into uh, the private sector as a consultant. Um, it, it, it brought to mind uh, my experience at law school at the University of Maryland, um, where one of my professors, uh, Richard Bolt, was a great believer in defining one's vision of practice in such a way to um, beyond actually the work, um, but to, uh, to help define what that work should do, what, what to focus on and, and what was going to ultimately lead to a path that uh, uh, created something of importance. And so I guess at Age United, my vision uh, intersected with Age United's vision to end the HIV epidemic. And then of course, to work intersectionally to do so um, but I think that uh, a vision of practice should go beyond immediate work. And um, that's what I set out to do in January. And then I can definitively say that the best plans of mice and men do in fact go astray because uh, between the sudden COVID pandemic and amidst um, George Floyd's truly tragic death with an incredible moment of protest of policing and then the rise of Black Lives Matter, um, everything did change. And I think it has permanently changed, um, not really just for my vision of practice, but I think it has changed for the entire country. Um, what I didn't really expect then was that as a result of this, my um, practice was to suddenly revolve around trying to remove millions of people from incarceration. And at the same time uh, that I was going to get drawn into a focus on, of all things, Medicaid. Um, so one of the things that, that did become true is that, um, with, uh, uh, that, I, that I began to work with um, a coalition of criminal justice organizers at uh, the Justice Roundtable. Um, I was a founding member of that coalition um, over 20 years ago. And um, I've, I, I kind of came back into my roots there. Sadly, um, it became absolutely imperative to take as many people from prison and move them back into the community as possible. And part of the reason was, of course, because prisons are the absolute uh, laboratory to spread uh, disease, um, including a disease such as COVID, especially when it's um, airborne. Sadly, uh, despite our efforts, fewer than 3% of prisoners nationwide have been removed from um, prisons and uh, local uh, community-based incarceration spaces. 
Um, and as a result, one of the things that we've seen is incredibly high rates of infection in prison. Um, and I'll just say that one of the things is that uh, prisons are not self-contained because of these rates of, uh, of incarceration in prison. Um, the, they, they become essentially spaces that will retransmit back into the community and especially into communities that, that house prisons. And this is just really um, a major issue. And I'll just say that uh, um, another issue is that we know that uh, people living with HIV have um, documented high incarceration rates. I've heard that it's as, uh, it's as high as a quarter of all people living with HIV may rotate through a prison at, at at that moment. And so getting people living with HIV out as much as anybody else um, what, uh, was truly important to us. So one of the things that uh, the Justice Roundtable did was to make a series of, I believe it's now upwards of 30 recommendations. Uh, and actually, Ali, maybe we could also share those recommendations. I'll send them to you um, after the, uh, the broadcast. Um, but I found myself working specifically around um, some issues uh, that were very specific to, uh, to Medicaid. Um, and in particular, that um, one of the things that, that goes on is that there is a provision within the Social Security Act that's commonly referred to as uh, the inmate exclusion, uh, which uh, prohibits the use of Medicaid funding and other federal funds uh, for medical care to, quote unquote, inmates of a public institution. Um, this applies not only to people who are incarcerated after um, being judged guilty, but also to those who have not been convicted of a crime. So in addition to the millions of people living uh, in prison uh, who have been convicted, there are uh, 500 and nearly 550,000 people who are incarcerated uh, in a pretrial detention. So our goal was to move as many of those folks as possible. And so our first recommendation was frankly, just to eliminate that um, inmate exclusion, which by the way, for those of you who work in Medicaid um, and substance abuse treatment, um, the uh, inmate exclusion provision also applies to inmates of other facilities. And that's the, one of the reasons that uh, Medicaid doesn't really apply to uh, or hasn't applied to uh, substance abuse treatment in person or um, uh, overnight um, med uh, mental health facilities. Um, we also sought to uh, release prison um, by trying to uh, provide incentives to uh, raise the uh, uh, federal medical assistance percentage for FNAP. So we were um, trying to essentially uh, bribe governors to do this. Um, I will say that the uh, Congress declined us on that point. But I'm going to come back to the uh, Medicaid. Um, and we finally also accepted a provision uh, um, that's now called the Medicaid Reentry Act um, to start uh, Medicaid benefits for eligible individuals 30 days prior to the, the release of custody, uh, meaning that we essentially created an exception to the uh, um, inmate exclusion provision. And, um, and I will just let you know that we've had a little bit of success uh, in that arena. Not, we haven't gotten there yet. Um, in the work that I do, many of you know that I do uh, work around um, public policy, working a lot with uh, members of Congress, uh, basically doing advocacy and um, a little bit of lobbying. Um, COVID has changed the way Congress is doing business. Um, in fact, Congress essentially left Washington in March and has uh, barely returned to the extent that they have returned um, the public cannot really gain entrance to uh, the buildings where members of Congress are and uh, the sort of spacing use of masks uh, that's become routine um, has really changed uh, the way uh, folks do business. Most congressional staffers are now working from home. So uh, we do video meetings routinely. Um, all of the Zoom that we're doing here, we do it now for uh, um, uh, for all of Congress. And I suspect that this is a uh, permanent change, uh, at least until there's a vaccine. I don't think Congress is going to respond the same way. What Congress did do is to enact uh, what I would refer to as three and a half uh, immediate responses to COVID. Uh, the first being an 8.3 billion emergency uh, package uh, in early March, followed by 
um, the uh, family's first coronavirus response, uh, known as families, um, in March, uh, in, in mid March, that uh, made coronavirus testing free, um, secured paid emergency leave, and enhanced unemployment insurance. And then um, Congress passed uh, what's known as the uh, CARES Act. Um, which uh, was about a, uh, over a trillion dollars uh, worth of relief. Um, the coronavirus AIDS relief and uh, coronavirus aid relief and economic security act. And that's the one that uh, provided $1,200 uh, cash payment for individual adults earning up to 75,000 per year, um, expanded unemployment insurance even farther and gave the $600 um, dollars, um, for uh, uh, employment check, um, all of those kinds of things. This is also the bill, and I think Jesse mentioned it briefly, that had an additional $100 million uh, for the Ryan White uh, uh, program. Um, and then there uh, has been additional funding for CDC, specifically really to focus on Congress. Um, we have been working on trying to uh, get um, further funding for syringe services programs, as Jesse mentioned in particular. Um, because they have proven to be particularly at risk, um, as well as continuing to, to seek additional funding for expanding HIV prevention. Um, there was a, uh, what I would refer to as the HALF, which was the Paycheck Protection Program and Healthcare Enhancement Act. Um, and that provided additional testing um, and put billions towards uh, uh, healthcare providers and small businesses, as well as 300 billion for uh, funding the small business administration loans. Um, and then finally, uh, so that's that's our three and a half. The House has actually passed a further three and a half trillion dollar bill that included um, the Medicaid Reentry Act that I, I, I spoke about. That is the uh, allowing 30 days of, uh, of um, a person living in incarceration to, uh, to access Medicaid before they move back into uh, the community. And of course, that would, I think, be um, incredibly helpful uh, in doing, um, in ensuring that there's a smooth transition, um, not just for uh, 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 people uh, who are, uh, who are basically at risk for COVID, but, but really for as many people as, as we can get uh, moved back into the uh, community. That bill, by the way, is going to be introduced. It's already introduced into the uh, House, but will be introduced as a standalone bill. Uh, we expect in the Senate one of these days. Um, so I'm just going to make a few quick observations before I stop. I will just say, by the way, that uh, further change is coming. We already know that appropriations is uh, resuming its normal course. So we're we're all working on appropriations, including a, uh, on um, HIV appropriations. Uh, and then with the election in the background, um, I think uh, this is really the space where uh, that's going to become a focus uh, throughout the fall. Um, one quick observation uh, basically is just that one of the things that I've become aware of, especially having focused a lot on the criminal justice response, is that the resources flowing into advocacy um, and the focus on advocacy in HIV is actually greater than that even surrounding that of the uh, ch trying to change the criminal justice system. Um, there just is not that sort of outlay from uh, private organizations uh, that, that um, go towards the criminal justice system. Even with, I think, the advent of Black Lives Matter, perhaps that's going to change, but it's something that I've just realized. And, um, and so as a result, it's much more organized around grassroots work. Um, and so what I think that uh, the, the issue around Black Lives Matter has taught us and the, and the protest is that we have to let people on the ground lead. Um, you know, we need to listen to prisoners. We need to listen to people of color uh, and to women and to ensure that uh, um, in my personal work, um, listening to children and incarcerated parents um, around parenting sentencing alternatives. Um, the reality is that this intersectional work um, led by people on the ground is really more necessary than ever. And that does bring me back to this uh, vision of practice. Um, my initial plan was to create a, a strategy consulting and planning firm, uh, you know, with an, a focus on the intersection of public health, criminal justice, and more specifically on harm reduction. And what I've learned from these last months is that the work has to be grounded in anti-racist, pro-science and pro-liberty 
uh, philosophy and it, that takes its direction from the people who are on the ground. So one of the so so it's been a pleasure really uh, to be able to come back into HIV, but it's all of these things now. And so I am grateful to uh, to everybody for uh, both uh, listening, but also to uh, being able to continue this work, and of course for the uh, Forger Award. So thank you all very much, and uh, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much, Bill. Thanks to all of our panelists. Um, uh, you will have access uh, to this program. Uh, Ali has forwarded the link to the participants in the chat. Um, and you will see a link also from Scott Schultz in the uh, chat. Um, now I'd like to get to uh, questions that we have. And the first one is um, that the technology issue is troubling. Uh, in this day and age. Can you speak to why there is such a tech gap and what might be done to lessen it? Who would, would like to start with that one, that question? I, well, I took a stab at it um, in the uh, Q&A actually. And what I said is that I, I, I think there's a an issue where, you know, um, HIV in a lot of ways, uh, the, the advocates for HIV have uh, really been able to take up a number of different issues and to say all of these things are healthcare. So it's housing, as Armin mentioned earlier, it's food, it's linguistics, it's the ability to have a car, it's even to be able to travel to um, a, a safer uh, clinic perhaps that is in, in somebody's town. Um, all of these things are, uh, are, are what we now consider part of healthcare. And I think that what's what I've realized over the years is that we now have to add technology uh, as being one of the uh, things that that um, that that becomes a basic part of healthcare, and you know, and it has to be a, a discussion about what's both affordable, usable by multiple clients, and what it, what are uh, technologies that that enhance the client experience and and their privacy. So, so I think part of it is we maybe need to reconceive what is what again once again and led by the HIV community that's good at this stuff to think about what is it that um, uh, that, that technology is healthcare. Thank you, Bill. So in Philadelphia, uh, the Ryan White HIV Planning Council is starting to consider that because they've now realized <clears throat> the serious gap in the tech um, in the tech field for the telemedicine. So people are still not getting to see their doctor. So uh, yesterday the planning council met and that was one of the agenda items is about technology for people living with HIV. So it's definitely gonna be considered part of healthcare to be able to have the tech. Thanks, Can I just weigh in on the, uh, oh, Scott? Yeah. So I'm just, I'll say quickly that, okay. um, Yes, I think that we need to uh, to be a uh, a part of the leadership on this and framing it as uh, healthcare, but also to be a part of a, a broader coalition that can frame it as also education and you know access to other services. Mm -hmm. So this technology piece is is not just healthcare. Obviously, um, we're learning now about the other gaps that are created when we uh, rely upon technology in things like education, etc. Thank you. Armin? I was just going to add that it's a real simple one in my community. It's poverty. Um, why do folks not have technology? They're broke. Uh, there's a reason why folks not only don't have the technology, but often can't maintain the technology. For those of us who work with indigent clients or have done so for a long time, everyone knows the routine of trying to figure out what number to call because that phone isn't working anymore. That client doesn't have a phone anymore. You've got to call and you've got to get releases to be able to talk because of HIPAA and HIV to the friend, to the mom, to someone who has the phone that that client is now utilizing because she can't afford to pay her phone bill. So it goes much deeper. It has to do with being able to afford the technology itself and then being able to maintain your phone bill, your Wi-Fi, your cable bill, uh, other things that our folks, that we may take for granted, but in our community that are very hard to come by. I have very few clients who are indigent who have consistently had phone service and computer or internet service. The, the, the percentage uh, mm -hmm. uh, of all of those things, if they even have the technology being steadily maintained is very small. It's a question of justice and poverty. 
And of course now most libraries are closed, so that's not available either. So, okay, our, oh, Jesse, did you, you have- having The same problem because so many of our staff who are now working remotely are facing the very same problem. They've got technological issues at their, in their homes that they never expected they would have before. And one of the reasons why the payroll the uh, Paycheck Protection Program is so helpful is because it is giving additional resources to help us transition to the long haul of virtual operations for our service delivery programs. Thank you. Um, and it occurs to me that in future negotiations, um, particularly in the medical and legal worlds uh, and public benefits, providing technology and internet needs to be part of the plan. Our next question um, is from someone living in New York City who um, is a longtime survivor and uh, whose income is just over the limit to receive uh, uh, public services, uh, legal services. Um, he's now charged with taking care of family members um, who have uh, many issues, that are, legal issues that have come up. And he's asking for resources um, in the New York City area for lawyers who might uh, take clients in his category. And after, I'm going to ask Armin that to begin with, but then I'd like if you could mention each of you what you know for available legal services in your areas. Sure. So. Uh, this individual should try calling the HIV Law Project because our uh, ability to serve is not just the poverty level, but significantly above it. And it sounds like this individual may well already know that. And so I don't want to repeat what's already known, but uh, we would certainly like to look afresh at that. So um, you can Google if you have that uh, capability, HIV Law Project, but the number uh, is 212-577-3001. And we do intake through the phone, obviously, particularly these days, and someone can look at it and call back and take a look at whether uh, that might be possible. Um, depending on the subject matter at hand here or at issue, there are others that may be able to provide, but I can't say sweepingly, right? You've got legal aid and legal services, the New York Lawyer Legal Assistance Group, mobilization for justice, just to name some of the big hitters here in New York, and they all probably have their own special uh, requirements. Um, but again, uh, income can be an issue. Thank you. Does anyone else have resources they'd like to suggest? Um, I know if you're, if we have listeners from Massachusetts, particularly the south coast of Massachusetts, um, I direct a clinic at UMass Law School where we prioritize uh, clients who are living with HIV. And that number is 508-985-1159. Scott, do you have any? Yeah, I'll just mention that, um, so Lambda Legal has um, a help desk and um, people can contact us nationwide. Um, and. Um, if we are not uh, able to assist um, the folks on that help desk, off, will help connect people with other resources um, that are re that are appropriate regionally, geographically, and and sub uh, subject matter wise. So um, that is available through our website, and um, and there's I don't have the number off the top of my head, um, but um, it is uh, if you look uh, www.lambdalegal.org/helpdesk is how to access that resource. Thank you. And in you, Philadelphia, um, uh, Philadelphia. We a, yeah, we have a huge public interest bar. So for whatever the issue is, there's probably a public interest law firm. But the AIDS Law Project is situated in Philadelphia and we have an office in Southern New Jersey, but we serve the whole state. But also there's community legal services in Philadelphia. There's Senior Law Center, there's Homeless Advocacy Project. There's institutional law project, so there is a lot in um, All right. in Philadelphia. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so um, we just have a short time left, but I want to direct this question. Um, I believe Scott might have this information. We have uh, someone who is a veteran 
and said that when she was uh, uh, in the service, there were certain medical conditions that precluded someone uh, from certain positions. Um, and she's wondering now, she's heard that the COVID-19, anyone who has tested positive is uh, not permitted to join the military. And she wondered if you have any more information on that. Yeah, so indeed the military did uh, issue this policy uh, recently that saying that anyone who had um, uh, survived COVID-19 would uh, not be able to enlist. I don't have a lot of detail about you know, what was behind that. Um, it, it seems another example to me of, of a sort of a knee-jerk reaction um, that may become uh, more difficult to undo. Um, you know, sometimes these things are put in place, but then as we learn more and the science changes, as it did with HIV, it becomes very difficult to, to take down a policy. I I'm hoping that they, um, that this is just something that they put in place, recognizing that there's so much we don't know about COVID-19 and its long-term effects on a person, and that for right now, they want to be cautious, but that they will re-examine this um, as we as we move forward, um, who knows? We might have we might be fighting them on this, you know, five years from now. But um, and then I, I saw that um, you know the the questioner asked also about uh, other conditions like asthma and things like mm -hmm. that that affect a person's ability to deploy. And indeed, um, you know, it's one of the tricky things about our litigation is that there are a whole list of things that the military um, has in place that prevent a person from joining. Um, the health conditions or possibly deploying. Um, and really the question is, well, are those based in legitimate science and you know, good reasons why a person with a particular health condition could not uh, deploy? Um, or are they based in outdated ideas, fear, stigma, uh, which is the, the case with respect to HIV? So they, those have to be sort of addressed on a case by case basis. We're not trying mm -hmm. to take down uh, all of their medical uh, requirements for the military. That's not our goal at all. Um, rather to get rid of the ones that are no longer based in science or reason, so. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I see our time is up. I want to thank all of our panelists. You were provided some wonderful information and we appreciate it so much. Uh, to our um, audience, I want to say if you asked a question that was not answered, we will do our best to answer and respond to you. Um, also, we hope you will join us each month. Uh, starting in August, our monthly webinars will be uh, held the first Tuesday of the month. So we look forward to your joining us then and thank you to the ABA and again, congratulations to our awardees. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Appreciate thank it. you everybody, be safe.